Okay, I'm going to read the uh, first chapter out of the book, I'm Not Leaving. Um, chapter 1, Why I Stayed. The white United Nations tank idled loudly outside the gates of our home as I hugged and kissed my parents and our three children, Mindy, Lisa, and Sean, goodbye. Holding Teresa, my wife, extra tight, I whispered, two weeks maximum, love. This thing can't last for more than two weeks. Then I'll come see you and the kids in Burundi, and probably in three weeks it'll be okay for you to come home. Love you. Taking my hand, Teresa stepped up into our pickup camper. I slowly closed the door behind her, pushing until I heard the latch click. Then I headed down the driveway. As I opened the gate, Colonel Luc Marshall, the commander of the Belgian troops in the UN force, emerged from the tank manhole and jumped down to my level. While shaking his hand, I couldn't thank him enough for escorting my family to the evacuation assembly point at the U.S. ambassador's home. The colonel didn't want to leave Rwanda, this picturesque little jewel on the belly button of Africa, till he felt he had done everything possible to complete his mission of evacuating all the foreigners. With their rifles at the ready, his men formed a circle around the perimeter of the tank. Our pickup camper crept down the driveway and poked its nose out onto the dirt road as the Belgian soldiers piled back into the tank and led the way. Less than a hundred meters down the road stood a barrier, nothing but a log that was raised up on two stones to indicate an ID checkpoint. Those manning the barrier scattered as the tank approached. I watched Colonel Marshall once again climb out of his vehicle and pitch the log aside. He could easily have drawn over it, driven over it, but it would have been a problem for our pickup. My dad was at the wheel and sticking to the back side of the tank like a magnet. In fact, when they got to the intersection, the tank couldn't make the right hand turn in one swing. As it started to roll back to make a second cut, dad wasn't able to get the camper into reverse quickly enough. The track of the tank actually backed into the pickup camper and broke the parking light on the right front fender just as dad popped the truck into gear and lurched backwards. I stood there barefoot in the middle of our dusty street waving goodbye to the most precious people in my world. The armadillo, that's what we called our camper, waddled around the corner as I lowered my hand. Looking around, I wanted to be sure our neighbors saw that I was not leaving. If any of them had ideas about busting into our home and going after Anita, the young lady who worked for us, or Jamvier, our young night watchman, I was going to be there. I didn't know what I'd do if we were attacked, but I would be there. Walking back inside our home, I could see the concern and fear on the faces of Anita and Janvier. Their ID cards both had the word Tutsi written on them, classifying them among Rwanda's minority tribe. But now it was more than a tribal marker. It marked them for extermination. For Teresa and myself, Anita and Janvier put a very real face on all the Tutsi people of Rwanda. Having them physically with us in the house kept our hearts engaged in our decision that I would stay and prevented logic or fear from dominating our thoughts. It's amazing how a person's physical presence can change the outcome of a situation. Simply being there is often the most powerful factor in making the right decision, a decision we'll not regret for the rest of our lives. Anita and Janvier's presence impacted our thinking, physically keeping me in Rwanda. Now, I was counting on my presence impacting the thinking of the killers and keeping them away from us. The plane crash. At exactly 6 p.m. four days earlier, April 6, 1994, the lights went out on us at the ADRA offices. Adventist Development Relief Agency. Losing electricity didn't surprise me and in the light from the setting sun I called to mom and dad. Let's call it a day and head home. If the electricity is off here it might be off at home and I'm pretty sure Lisa and Sean are alone with Anita. By now Teresa will have gone with Mindy to another missionary friend's home. Four years earlier in March 1990 Teresa and I had come to Rwanda with our three children whose ages were six, three, and one and a half years at the time. I was the country director of ADRA, the humanitarian arm of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
Dad had arrived in Kigali in January 1994 to manage the financial side of a post-war clinic rehab project and Mom had come for the last three weeks of his stay. They both were scheduled to return to the States in five days. Yeah, the footnote says there was a three-year civil war in Rwanda from 1990 to 93 before the genocide. The lights were on as we pulled up to the house, which was a good sign. Electricity had been pretty sketchy in the evenings recently. After dinner, everyone was busy doing his or her own thing when we heard a louder than normal explosion. I say louder than normal because grenade explosions around the city had become rather commonplace. The international community was forcing democracy on Rwanda. Both the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund were saying they would no longer fund a one-party state. Overnight, more than a dozen political parties sprang up. The arrival of this democracy brought instability and expressed itself with increasing levels of petty and sometimes not so petty crime. Apparently, many people now thought they could do whatever they pleased. That was a loud one, Dad said. Yeah, I replied. I wonder if it was an ammunition stockpile or something. We didn't think much more about it until the phone rang 20 minutes later. Jake, a Canadian friend teaching at the Adventist University located in the northwest corner of the country, asked, Can you see the flames? What flames? I asked. They're announcing on the radio that the president's plane was shot down as it was landing, he replied. Wow, we did hear an explosion. I'll go outside and look towards the airport. Hanging up the phone, I turned to my family and said, The president's plane was just shot down. A stunned silence filled the room, stopping us where we stood. I stepped outside but couldn't see any flames glowing in the starry sky because of the hills between us and the airport five miles away. A few minutes later, we began hearing sporadic gunfire echo through the hills and valleys of our city. Teresa and I started telephoning other missionary families to see how they were. Teresa remembers one call in particular with Betty Stanek, a volunteer from the former Yugoslavia. Betty had been talking with some of her Belgian UN peacekeeper friends, and she ended the conversation with Teresa by saying, I'm scared. Her comment caught Teresa off guard. We'd been living with this tension for so long that we didn't immediately recognize how the president's plane crash had spiked the situation to a very dangerous level. Still not feeling very threatened, we each went to sleep in our own beds that night, unaware of the plans that had been set in motion by the president's assassination. Plans that would separate this tiny nation like a train car from the rest of the planet and send it plunging into the most tragic 100 days of the 20th century. That's the end of chapter one.